Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to the Moonset Safari. <laughs> no, actually, welcome to the Sunrise Safari, but as you can see, we have the most incredible shot of the setting moon, and it's amazing how fast, actually, Andrew and I were just commenting on it, the way that it's setting, and the speed that it's setting at, where actually you've arrived at just the right time, because it's almost at the point where it's going to disappear from our horizon. called it the Moonset Safari because we haven't quite got around to the sunrise part of it yet. But welcome, nonetheless. My name is Janie and I have a presenter light because <laughs> we're going to be creepy this morning. But welcome to the Sunrise Safari. My name is Janie and I have Andrew on camera with me this morning. Scotty is out and about with Viam. There we go. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> the bright light of us making a plan. And don't forget, we are coming to you live from Juma and Arethusa Game Reserves within the Sabi Sands, the greater Kruger area of South Africa. And the amazing thing about live safaris is that you just never know what to expect around the next corner. We're also interactive, so you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email them through to questions at wildearth.tv. And before we carry on, I just want to show you the other side opposite direction to the moon where the sun is starting to slowly think about poking its head on the over the horizon I think it feels as though a late start is in order now I'm going to make my way across to the hyena den we had to wait a little bit it's still too dark and as you know we can't spotlight the little hyenas they're still far too young so we've been exploring around quarantine, looking at the sleepy impala and zebra that are wandering around. And of course, as always, keeping an eye out for the Queen of Juma. And Kim B, you were saying that the birds at the start of the sunrise safari are always glorious. It is one of my favorite times of day to be out in the bush. If not, no, it's definitely, this is my favorite time to be out in the bush. I don't know if you could hear it, but there was a black-bellied bustard doing its little whistle and then champagne cork pop at the end of its call. There's quite a few of them wandering around this nice open area. There are also some drongos calling. The Crested Franklins haven't got up yet that I could hear. Guinea fowl, scrub robins, all rejoicing that they have survived the night. The other thing, of course, about full moon is that the birdies tend to get up earlier as well. And in fact, even in the middle of the night, if you are around during full moon, if you go out, you'll probably hear one or two very confused turtle doves calling kingfishers as well for some reason it's always those two species that get terribly confused when the moon is full and there's a plenty of light <laughs> Roy Phelps you said that that was beautiful well it is it was a beautiful beautiful scene that we started our <laughs> our sunrise safari to that stunning, stunning full moon. A sight we only get to enjoy once a month. Once a month. And it wasn't just Roy that was enjoying it. We were all thoroughly loving the image of the moon moving through the sky. Gone already, almost gone. On its way out. And as much as we'd love to stay and look at the scenery all day, we have ex fun and exciting things to follow up on. Keep your eyes peeled. It could be a chameleon, it could be a bush baby. Oh, there could be Andrew. <laughs> Andrew's cameo appearance for the morning. <laughs> While we go exploring to find you new and exciting things to look at. Speaking 
of exciting things that Scott would like to say. Well, hello and good morning. Welcome on board with myself, Scott, and Viem, my trusty cameraman for this morning. We are really looking forward to the adventure that awaits us. It is a wonderful morning, as I'm sure you gathered starting off on Jamie's vehicle beautiful bird song this morning not a cloud in the sky really other than a few very low on the eastern horizon that you can see there but it's a really awesome day the animals are really wide awake and it's going to heat up into quite a hot day but for now it's nice and cool and hopefully predators are still on the move and that's what we're looking for now we're looking for any sign of a female leopard called Perula. Brent had her tracks and some alarm calls in this di or in this general area um, yesterday and interestingly we've just come across some leopard tracks now I'm not sure if these are the same tracks that Brent had from yesterday and I don't think they are at first glance they're looking quite fresh what I'm going to do is I'm just going to shine my flashlight onto them at a low angle. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, you can see those two kind of on that little bump there. There, oh, there we go. Perfect. So there's a female leopard track there with her toes on the front end of the track and the back pad on the back end. What's complicated there is that the two footprints registered on top of one another. So it's two tracks blending into one and the same case over there and when the two feet register the back foot onto the front foot that indicates that the leopard is moving at a, a kind of regular walking speed it's not running if it was running each footprint would fall individually into its own spot now that's good that we found these tracks i'm confident they are fresh and from last night just looking at these two but Let's take a look at a few more, or I will at least, as we drive along here, just to make sure they are in fact fresh. Now, I'm fairly confident that these are from last night, and the area that we're in indicates to me that it could be one of two leopards, either Karula or Shadow. This is kind of a fringe area of their territory, and they both overlap in this area. So it could be either of those two. Can't see any more tracks. It's difficult, and obviously having to use my flashlight to aid in seeing them. Um, as the sun gets a little bit higher, it will become more and more easy for us to track. But for now, it's going to be a little bit slow process. to Genevieve who's in a very cold and snowy New York and Genevieve is wishing that she was on safari and wondering what is one of the major senses that you feel when you first touch down in Africa on safari and a lot of people say the smell of Africa is quite distinct so I guess that may hit you as you step off the plane um, and I tend to agree there's this kind of smell that Africa has with it and that would probably be yeah the top of the list and then depending on where you go on safari I guess various different things will affect you um, the Masai Mara I always remember had a huge impact on me and I got quite emotional so I was surprised by how emotional I got flying into that vast open space which I'm not used to and that combined with the incredibly 
large amounts of animals running through those vast open plains was a really moving moment for me. So I guess a lot depends on where you are going on safari, Genevieve. But I think it's time that you really settle down and look into when to come out and we can help you plan your safari as much as possible. So feel free to ask us as many questions as you like. As for the rest of you, if there's any help we can give you with planning trips, let us know. Now, I'm not too sure where these tracks have gone. We'll just carry on snooping around you, even though I can't see where the tracks are now. We'll just keep snooping around, maybe stop and have a listen, and then head back to where I had the last tracks once we've got a little bit more light. Now, <clears throat> morning, Mike Fleetwood. And Mike would like to know if we ever guide regular guests in between the Safari Live productions. And Mike, the answer to that is no at the moment. Um, full-time on Safari Live and we basically work six weeks on and then two weeks off. Um, but we are poss looking into possibly doing a bit of our own private guiding on the side, a couple of us. So that is something that we may be offering in the future. But watch this space for now that we are just taking you guys on drive. And hopefully, like I said in the future, you guys will be able to come out and we'll be able to take you on Safari. So, that is something we're trying to look into, but obviously, if we all start doing that, then there'll be nobody to take you on these drives. So, we don't want to create that situation. But I think there's going to be a lot of change this year, Mike, and change for the good. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how much Safari Life develops. Yeah, I know for certain it was massive growth and change over 2015, which was my first full year on Safari Live. And I think there are some great things in the pipeline, so let's see what happens, but feeling positive. to Aaron in New Zealand who sent through an update saying that they've heard some lions roaring on the Arethusa dam cam and for those of you who don't know we've got two live feeds coming from the water hole on Juma called the Juma water hole cam and then one on Arethusa called the Arethusa water hole cam and while we are not on these live safaris it's a great way for you to be able to see what's going on in Africa to log on to those two cameras Aaron, thanks very much. I didn't hear the lion, and we're quite a way off from Arethusa, where our camp is, probably about three miles, I'd say. And even though you can quite easily hear lion from that distance, they may have been a lot further to the west than that or to the south. So that, combined with the fact that I'm a very deep sleeper, meant that I certainly didn't hear anything. But it is very useful for us to know that, and we may well head across there later to see what is going on. The tricky thing, uh, Aaron, is that where the Arethusa water hole is, is not on the center of Arethusa, it's kind of close to the camp, and the camp itself is situated close to their western boundary, or our western boundary of their property, as well as quite close to their southern boundary. So, not in the best spots, regarding lion audio because there's a strong chance those lions could have been off the Arethusa property or at least the area that we can traverse. And again, don't be confused um, by the areas that we can traverse in relation to the camps whose properties we traverse and their guides. Their guides have got generally a lot more space than us to drive around. And it's useful that we say that because obviously if you are ever planning on going on safari, the area of traverse makes a big difference. Where did this leopard go? I'm wondering if the tracks weren't from yesterday. But 
but too soon to panic. And here they are here. They are certainly not from yesterday. And they I'll try again hold my flashlight at a low angle. There we go. So the fact that we can see these tracks crossing this road indicate to me that the tracks are in fact from today or last night and the reason we can be sure about that or so almost f certain about that is that this is quite a busy road and these tracks would not be visible had they have been from the night before last because lots of vehicles have driven here so sadly that leopard heads straight south over our southern boundary into no man's land now, we do have a few options. It could be that this leopard is shadow, and <clears throat> let me pull out my little map and show you what's what here, because it can be a little bit confusing. Um, just need a little branch to be able to work out what's what. And here we go, them all sorted. So, this is our traverse area. Um, and let me zoom out fully so that you can see. Juma is the big block on, sorry, I'm make, sorry if I'm making a bit of a meal of this. Um, we'll get there eventually. You can see I'm not very good on my cell phone. So the square on the top right is Juma. This line here is the boundary between Juma and Arethusa, which is the property on the left. Now, we are this little blue dot. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. We are the blue dot. The leopard tracks are coming south to this point. Now, there's a strong chance you could jump onto this road and follow it and then come into Arethusa over here. This is the main access road to Arethusa, which leads to the airstrip here. So I'm thinking it might be worth checking up to here and seeing if this leopard doesn't in fact pop out on Sarathusa where we can track her, but there's this little patch here of green where we cannot follow her. So that's where we are and what's going on. And I'm gonna now continue with that plan. So let's do that. And while we do that, we've got some great news for you. Jamie is at the hyena den, and it sounds like you guys are in luck. Well, we have arrived at the hyena den, and like all exhausted mothers all over the world, Corky has decided to take a break after a long night of attempting to get into the DRC, which is the camp where th that we live at, and having to be chased out at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> She's now decided, first of all, to act as a roadblock, and second of all, to lie down fairly far away from the nagging attentions of her cubs. And just to give you a little bit of perspective, you can see she's moved away from the den, left her cubs to sleep in the tunnels, <laughs> and essentially blocked us from going too much closer without actually disturbing her personal space. Madam is here, and I'm really hoping that we might get a glimpse of the new cubs this morning. That's why I've come here so early, is to make sure it's usually the time of day when they start to be a bit more active and we've got a much better chance of seeing them. Corky, I'm going to move forward ever so slightly, girl, just so that Andrew can see the other part of the den. Don't you worry. No stress. Is Madam sitting in her usual spot in the top right entrance to the den. And since I was describing the fact that Corky came wandering through last night, Tom, who's watching in Dallas, you were wondering how on earth we can sleep deeply 
with bushbuck and cobras and hyenas having access to our houses. Well, fortunately, we, they generally don't have access to our rooms. And it's something you just get used to. Um, we're fairly familiar with it. When you live out here for an extended period of time, you get used to all kinds of strange encounters. I personally still feel far safer sleeping out here than I do sleeping in a city. I just feel a lot more secure. Uh, I think it's just, a, it's just a matter of being habituated to it. And of course, also the knowledge that nothing's out to hurt you. Nothing's going to deliberately attack you. So hyenas aren't going to unlock doors. And cobras generally aren't going to bite you unless something really, really unfortunate happens. So we're very lucky. Just by the way, that shield cobra that Brent put up the video of, and for those of you who missed it, there was a video that made its way into Inga's house, which is where some of us live. Beautiful, beautiful little snake. Really stunning, very squat, with a sort of a pinkish hue to it, and a slight hood. Just so that you know, it's not actually a true cobra. It's part of the shield nose snakes which are related to cobras, but not actually cobras. So, aggressive little creature. He did sort of sit up and flare its hood, but no real desire to bite us, and immediately shot away. But it was such an unusual sighting. Apparently, it's very, very rare to see them. It was certainly a first for me, and I think it was actually a first for all of the other presenters as well. What do you think, Corky? Do you sleep soundly and deeply? <laughs> Very soundly, very deeply, absolutely fast asleep. And Katie Jo. Katie Jo is five years old and watching in Indiana. Hello, Katie Jo. You wanted to know if these hyenas are like the evil hyenas in The Lion King. I have to tell you, Katie Jo, they are my favorite animals. And they're not evil at all. They're actually, of all of the predators out here, they are probably the smartest. There's so much going on in those heads. They're curious, they're problem solvers, and they've got incredible bonds between the different clan members and between the families. They're also not just scavengers. They can also hunt really, really well. So they don't just steal other animals' food. And I think, personally, that they are quite beautiful. Let's see her gently breathing. Now, Katie Joe, you have to keep watching because in a moment, well, fairly soon, I would hope, this hyena that you were looking at, her cubs will come out and you'll get to see exactly how wonderful hyenas can be. The cubs are so, so cute. They look like, how can I describe it? They're all big ears and wobbly legs and big feet. They are the cutest things to watch, but they also, it's so fascinating to watch their bonds with their mothers because they've got very, very strong maternal bonds and they'll go and they'll have a feed and a suckle and then they'll play with each other just like puppies and kittens do. We just have to wait. I think they're feeling a bit sleepy this morning. Not in any desire to pop out. I wonder if Madam is suckling those new cubs right now. And to continue with our hyena raider story, Jim Butler, you were wondering a little bit more about the background to the story. You were wondering if the compound is fenced and how one goes about chasing out a hyena. So the hyena, it is fenced, but there are a couple of gaps where the hyenas can come in if they want to. In general, it's almost impossible to fence an animal that doesn't want to be fenced. What on earth was that about, Corky? What do you think? Franklin's shouting. I wonder if it was being chased. I don't see a bird of prey. Maybe it just lost a fight. What's happening? Hey, Corky? What's that silly bird doing? Mm, not that interested. So, Jim, yes, the, the compound is fenced, but they can wander in. It were, they, would look off, they look for an opportunity to raid the dustbins, 
fortunately the dustbins get locked up at night but occasionally they make their way into the sort of the what is essentially the recycling bin of the camp so where there's no food and they pull out boxes and have a bit of an exploration and in terms of how one chases them away you step outside and clap your hands or hyenas are not man hunters they will immediately react with a fear response and race away they don't like being caught out they might give you a bit of a mischievous look as they exit but beyond that we've had some interesting encounters and i'm sure many of you have met howard which is brent's cardboard cutout the sort of life-size cardboard cutout of a hyena and Howard has made a couple of appearances outside people's rooms as part of a joke or occasionally in the corridor to the bathroom. I think probably its best victim was Scott Dyson, who came out of his room to be faced with a hyena in semi-darkness. And he couldn't understand why it wasn't running away from him. <laughs> it was one of the funniest things I've seen, was Scott going, hey, hey, hey! <laughs> when we left it outside his room anyway. You know, practical jokes to keep you entertained, but occasionally it is a real hyena. We've had them wander through at Ingers as well. If the gate is left open, they come through, but no, no threat at all to any of us. And they'll immediately run away when presented with the first opportunity to do so. Even when cornered actually, and it has happened in the past, hyenas will take every option over attacking or coming into contact with people. The only real cases of hyenas attacking people are not really true cases of them attacking. It's more that people have been sleeping outside without having any kind of watch, any kind of protection. And hyenas go up to explore. And because they don't have thumbs like we do, they explore with their teeth. Which has, there's one or two very, very isolated cases of people falling victim to hyenas. Highly unusual and generally as a result of interference beforehand or sleeping out unprotected. What do you think, hey, Corky? You can see she is exhausted from her nightly adventures. But Curtis, you were wondering how much time hyenas spend sleeping during their day. Just wait for the Franklins to finish having their morning conversation. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> Look there. <laughs> you ducked my head down. <laughs> Oopsie Daisy. Didn't even see you. Be surprised how that camouflage works. Hello, June. Oh, there goes the Franklin that was shouting. Sorry, Curtis, I'll answer your question in one moment. <laughs> very, very common to see Franklin around den sites. Both wild dog and hyenas generally have quite a good relationship with them. And in fact, in the case of the wild dogs, the pups will actually play with the Franklin, but never hunt them, because they do them quite a good cleaning service. They clean up all of the waste around a den site helps to keep it clean. Hyenas are less likely to play with them and more likely to chase them, but they still have that connection around den sites. Dashing. Well done, Andrew. Keeping pace with the bird that is incredibly cryptically colored. Right, so back to the answer to Curtis's question. You're wondering how many hours a day the hyenas sleep. It's generally about, it depends on the day, it depends on how much they've eaten. They sleep less than lions do. They're usually active throughout the night and then during the day they find, so maybe about 12 hours. But then again, much like we were talking about with those Nkuhuma lions that spent the afternoon sleeping with Andrew and myself, they are generally, it's sleep, but it's not really deep, deep sleep. It's not undisturbed sleep. And as we saw with Corky now, she's constantly sort of looking up and around. And even now, at this den site, we're missing, we're still missing at least Pretty. So Pretty and Bella are currently wandering around still, looking for some kind of access to food. And we've noticed that the hyenas have had some very, very full bellies over the last few days. And I, I said it was largely because of the dead hippo that was on Torchwood. 
They still looking, to me, they still look full. They still look well fed. So they've spent the night wandering through. Well, we see if it's, yeah, I would say it's about 10 to 12 hours a day, depending on the day they're having. Hyenas, to me, are always, always busy doing something. They've always got a curious, mischievous look in their eyes. Except, of course, when they are completely flat, as they are this morning. Those incredible feet and powerful limbs of the hyena are what give it the ability to cover incredible distances. Look how she has worn down her claws. You barely see them coming through. Joseph, you were wondering how fast a hyena can run. Well, the answer is between 40 to 60 kilometers an hour, which is about, I would say, just under 20 miles per hour up to about just under 30 miles per hour. So they're fast, but what makes, what sets hyenas apart and puts them in a similar, um, a similar style to the wild dogs is their sheer stamina. So whilst a lion or a leopard might be faster over short distances, they can't sustain it for more than a couple of hundred meters. Hyenas can lope for kilometers and kilometers. And you see those powerful muscles of the shoulders. And when we have an opportunity, I'll actually stop and show you the way that their tracks work and the way that they move. Because they've got something, they walk in a way or trot in a way that's known as a crosswalk. And it's a very energy efficient way of moving. It means essentially that the forelimbs do most of the work and the back limbs kind of just swing into place, moving diagonally across their body. And they can travel for easily up to 40 kilometers in one night, so close to 20 miles in a night, just wandering. Now for our hyenas, it's slightly different. They don't have to go as far. They've got regular access to food. But for hyenas, for example, within the Kalahari or the desert areas, they cover enormous distances. And they do so in a very energy efficient way. And everything, all of the hyenas' evolutionary tactics Almost all of that has evolved as a way to compete with lions and to survive in a world where the lion is dominant. Everything from their social structure to the fact that the females are bigger and stronger than the male, right down to the structure of their shoulders and their feet. And the other aspect, of course, about those powerful shoulders is muscle attachment for the power of the jaw. Sorry, I got distracted, but love three dogs. You were saying that the hyenas have such incredibly powerful necks. And yes, as I was saying, with the connection to that powerful jaw that they have, they also have a, oh, what's it called? A dorsal ridge that runs along the top of their skull. And all of that serves as attachments for the tendons and the muscles to link together and create a really, really powerful crushing bite force incredibly strong jaws and of course that in turn has got to be accompanied by the muscles that run down the neck and into the shoulders because it's no good having just n muscles around the jaw if you're going to be able to break some of the thick thick the thick thick bones that they are able to crunch through and Alice you were also amazed at the muscles of the hyena they are sheer power in terms of their size they really are incredible creatures to think that they can they could easily bite straight through the leg of an animal quite easily is phenomenal to me and that they've adapted to break open bones in the way that they have it gives you just a rough idea of exactly how strong those jaws really are and since they seem to be sleeping this morning and the cubs have yet to show themselves Let's pop over to Scott and find out how his morning is going. So, got some updates from Sean, one of the Arethusa guides, and it turns out that the leopard tracks that we found a bit earlier on belong to Shadow, a 
as we speculate it could be the case. And they were from about 7.30 last night. They saw her crossing out of Juma into a property called Kaufmann's. Now, I was hoping that she was going to cross over that boundary road that I showed you into Arethusa, but no sign of her doing so. We've just checked as far south as possible. This is the southern boundary of Arethusa that we can drive along at the southern end of the airstrip. So there's a chance the road was quite hard that she may have come in here. So we're going to still be searching for her. But we may continue further west in the hope that we may find a different leopard. And he's a brute, a big male leopard called the Anderson male that we've only managed to, to get on camera a handful of times so far, I think two or three times. So that is the plan. And we're also going to see, if we don't have any luck, working up where those lions that Aaron in New Zealand heard roaring have gone. Now, this is quite interesting. Um, there's an Egyptian goose up in the nest in that tree there, Vian. Um, you may have possibly heard the one taking off. Um, they're quite loud birds. Now, what's fascinating about this is that you often don't expect to see a goose or a duck up in a tree like this. And what's awesome is that it looks like they've capitalized on red-billed buffalo weavers' nests and have simply set up their home directly on top of the apartments that the communal red-billed buffalo weavers will live in. Now, what's even harder to believe is that up in there, the little goslings will hatch and within hours of hatching, they are going to have to plummet from there all the way to the ground. And as VM pans down, you'll get an idea that it's quite a drop. And they're going to land in a pile of impala poop. That's going to be their landing pad. Oh, no, not quite. That's in the foreground, that little black coloration on the ground. But that, I would say, is, sure, that's high. I mean, I would say that that's probably about two meters, four meters, six meters, -ish, six or seven meters up, that those tiny little goslings are gonna have to free fall. Thankfully though, their bodies are quite flexible and can take a bit of a pounding early on. There's actually an awesome documentary. I don't remember what it's called, but the cameraman got some remarkable footage of these little goslings plummeting out of a tree into the, a, a pile of leaf litter. I think their home was a little bit better than ours. Man, there's something just eyeing us out here. And this is one of my favorite things. When young vervet monkeys like this one come to investigate you and watch how it'll bobble its head from side to side. There we go. I'm doing the same thing to it, which is actually would be hilarious for you to see. But I don't know if it's going to be possible. And it kind of excites them. If you bob and shake your head from side to side, they tend to want to <laughs> do the same thing back. <laughs> and that's a little youngster. And it's coming right out into the open, very close to us. And I'm looking around trying to work out where the rest of its trip could be. You are too small to be here alone. Now what we may find is that other members of the troop may be higher up in this knobthorn acacia that he's busy clambering up. But just hidden from us. And as you can see, the higher up he gets, it gets very thick up there, so there could well be some more Monkey's hiding out. Let's see if we can reposition and work out what's going on here. Maybe they're in a tree nearby there. That individual seemed far too small to be alone though. I don't remember who it was, but yesterday somebody asked if we see any monkeys here, so I hope they're watching now. I've got a feeling though that it's just this. Oh, you got another one up there, yeah? Uh, awesome. Well, VM has spotted more than one. So at least that monkey is not alone. Oh, 
There we go. A little bit of movement up there. Uh, awesome, VM. Well done. There's one that you can see on the top of the screen and then another one slightly below it, I think. Oh, no, there's another tail up there. Well done, VM. And that's better, so nothing to worry about. Good stuff. I was just thinking, now, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just set up a camera at that goose nest in anticipation for the goslings plummeting out? It would be an incredible thing to, to witness. One camera on top of the nest showing us a bird's eye view so we know when the eggs hatch. We can see that all happening and then Another camera from the ground capturing that massive jump that they have to execute. So imagine that, you hatch and within hours of hatching you get, you have to walk the plank off the, out of the nest. Incredible. Then the next thing that they have to do is get from there to the closest point of water, which could be, if this drought continues, a long walk away to the Arethusa water hole. It's about a mile from that nest to the Arethusa water hole. Not quite, maybe three quarters of a mile. But imagine these tiny little furballs having to get all that way through all the hazards that lie between them and the water. years old in Ohio and you would like to know if there's a chance that the little monkeys would possibly go and raid birds nests for their eggs and apologies I said your name wrong it's not CT it's Kiki and yes Kiki monkeys are definitely known for raiding nests so there's a strong chance that they could try and steal not only the eggs, but even the baby birds. A lot of the monkeys are omnivorous. They'll eat mainly plants and fruits and vegetable matter, but a lot of them will also eat meat. And what's interesting, Kiki, is that baboons, another kind of primate that we get here, not very often though, but we do get to see them every now and then, will actually hunt baby antelope in order to feed on them. And some troops will, will, will be very, very well known for hunting and eating meat. So, no different to us, I guess. We're just big monkeys at the end of the day. We don't have much fur left on us. Um, and we eat a lot of meat. Good question, Kiki. It's something that I actually haven't seen happening, but it definitely does happen. Sarah in Ohio, I'm very happy to hear that you enjoyed the little map that I brought out to show you where we were, where the traps were heading, and I suppose it's something we need to think of doing a little bit more often, Sarah, to let you know what's going on and get a better idea of what we're dealing with with the boundaries and the tracks when we are tracking. So thank you for that feedback. Debs would like to know if anyone can use that app, and I'm going to need to <coughs> ask Mike Grover, who is the lodge manager's husband at Juma, and it's his, his app, well it's not his app, but he, he does all of the maps for a certain app that everyone has access to, so Debs, I'm not too sure on how it will all work, and 
I think the app will only work if you are actually out here. Um, and then it tells you where you are. Um, whereas if you're not sure, then it wouldn't work. So we're going to have to do a little bit more research on that. And we will keep you updated. Sadly, I don't know much about technology and how it all works. So I'm the last person that should be asked tech-related questions. It's very, very useful. I mean, it was remarkably easy getting to know these properties with this GPS app that tells you exactly where you are, what road you're on, which direction you're heading in. So your chances of getting lost, lost become zero, which is very useful. And it definitely increases the spike in your learning. It's a quick learning curve with this little app as opposed to the old school maps that you'd have to use when learning the roads. Okay, well, while we get closer to the area where I expect to find some tracks of the Anderson male leopard, we're going to send you back to the hyena den with Jamie. You hear from the guys later. Uh, the Ingala were on our dam wall last night at the past. Here we go. Corky is up. Having a bit of a general clean. Sorry guys, I was just right in the middle of a conversation on the Game Drive channel. Oh, no, go go fetch your babies. I don't know. <laughs> Where are you off to? Going wandering again. Oh, I said they were full. Actually, she's not that full. Having a look at her now. In fact, she still looks quite hungry. Maybe going out to see if she can find any food. And that's what I meant when I said it depends on the circumstances with hyenas and how long they sleep for during the day. It is largely dependent on how hungry they are or what they've been up to the night before. But she has given us a good opportunity to go and have a look at the other part of the den. Absolutely. I mean, I would love to spend a bit more time with these hyenas. Hello! Hey, Corky, you were blocking us from the best view in the house. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah, pretty is here. Sorry, everyone. I couldn't see behind the Tamburti and I couldn't look around because Corky was in the way. But look who's here. Look who's come out to play. I wondered, I thought it was very strange that the cubs were not out and about. And yes, absolutely. Paul Rizzo, you've got it exactly right. These hyenas are so intriguing. And you were saying that you have a feeling that their true behavior only comes out at night. Completely agree with you. I also think that however much we put conjecture into what exactly is happening at this den site, we will never know the full truth of it. We can only really comment on what we observe. We're never going to know exactly how their dynamics are playing out or exactly what's happening within their clan. <laughs> Here we go. Not at all the evil hyenas from the Lion King. There's the cute little ones. some serious chewing going on back there. Poor pretty. Maybe you should have taken Corky's approach. He's sitting a little way away. Now you can understand why she moved away. November giving mom a thorough nipping. Look how gentle she, gently she is responding. <laughs> the mother's put up with so much at these den sites with their little cubs because I promise you those teeth are not to be trifled with even at that young age. I 
to do needles. Hyenas are born with their teeth fully erupted, or at least their milk teeth fully erupted, and they then spend the next six months of their lives teething. And that means, as with any little animal, constantly chewing to try and relieve some of the looser teeth or to remove some of them. You're standing on your mother. And hard to believe when we look at these animals that we see them as so dog-like. They've got a lot of things that look so similar. But Aqua, as you were saying, they are more closely related to the cat family. And you were saying that it's you wonder what it was in their evolutionary path that led them to be more closely related to cats than to dogs. And it's a very distant relation. And they actually fall probably closer to, or at least are connected to the ancestors of things like a mongoose or a civet as well, because similarly to those animals, <laughs> they have anal glands that are capable of anal pasting, unlike cats and dogs. I know that dogs do have anal glands, but they don't paste in the same way that hyenas do. Oh, you're having a thorough bath. Ooh. I love that sound. be able to see her. I can see her now. Please don't stop doing that, Poppy. I want to stop her. Come on. Keep up with your call. And that, ooh, that was echoing across the area, and it's not corky either. Not sure which hyena this is. But obviously announcing his or her arrival at the den, and this could be interesting to see how this dynamic plays out. Who are you? I don't immediately recognize which hyena this is, but the wonderful thing about sitting at a den site is that you get to watch the dynamics play out and all of the members of the clan treat it almost like a family house. So even though they spend most of their day away from the den site, they will come and visit every now and again. You can see, oh, fresh injury on the back left, just underneath the tail. Looks fairly open. It's the standard nipping position. Let's the off. Nelson, that sound that you heard echoing across the plains. Look at November. So curious. Sorry, Nelson, I'll be with you in one moment. That sound that you heard was the hyena contact call. Ooh. And that was incredible because it was echoing. And in this case, I think it came, from, it was this individual that was calling, announcing his or her arrival at the den. Now making that gentle, submissive, low sound. Whoever this hyena is, seems to be playing very submissive to November. Let's try and see if we can get a view of the greeting that's happening between the cub and this individual. Den site. It's very, very dense. But Norman, welcome to our 
sunrise safari. I hope you are enjoying these incredible creatures as much as we do. And the sub-adult's going to investigate now as well. And immediately he is back, very submissive and anal pasting as part of the standard hyena greeting ceremony. It's another one of the little sub-adults. Hello, you're coming to investigate the car. Who are you? I don't know you. You can see how comfortable they feel with us moving right next to the car and around the bonnet. So, so comfortable with people and vehicles that they feel that they can walk right up to the tires, have a bit of an investigative sniff. It's one of the reasons why I love hyenas. They're curious. We've, got, we've now got this unknown adult, although I think it's quite young. We've got two sub-adults wandering through, three sets of cubs under three months old. And Maggie, you were wondering if this clan has got bigger or if there are less individuals at this den. Uh, this clan is definitely growing at a very rapid rate. The drought has done this clan several favors. It's made life much easier for them. And hyenas, of course, are one of the animals that are going to benefit. It's so interesting watching them respond to that individual. I was wrong, by the way. I think it was Bella that was lying down to our right when we first came here. Then there's one of the twins that was born in February last year, and then June has just made his or her way in as well. You can see, you notice that I'm very careful with the gender of the cubs, and that's because it is so tricky to actually be able to tell. Both the females and the males, for new viewers, have, the males have a penis, the females have a false penis or a pseudo penis. Although you can tell the difference by looking closely, particularly at the tip of the reproductive organ, which is really only visible generally during greetings and interactions with other hyena. There you go, presenting for November to sniff. And that's a very submissive response as well from the larger sub-adult. Cocking the leg up and exposing the genitals is essentially exposing the most vulnerable parts of the hyena and a way of saying, I submit to you. And probably, can I come play with you in this case? And the sub-adults and the younger cubs keep each other very entertained and always incredibly gently. These sub-adults would be more than capable of injuring November. But they know that with mom watching carefully, they've got to be gentle with her in case she starts to squeal and mom decides to step in. Hello. Now the reason that I'm so careful with judging the sex of a hyena, and yes you can tell, as I said, by looking at the tip, the reason I'm so careful with it is I have sat and watched a cub before for a couple of years, from birth to adulthood, and I was convinced it was a male, having really closely checked the diagrams, looked at the narrowing around the tip, and thus was very surprised when all of a sudden it turned out to be pregnant. So I'm now extra cautious about determining the gender of hyenas. <laughs> hyenas everywhere, yes Maggie. This clan is doing very, very well. And since I've arrived, as far as I know, and we still, we don't know, it's not confirmed, but as far as I know, since my arrival in July last year, 
only one of the cubs that's been raised by this clan has at least not been seen to reach sub-adulthood, and that's one of the twins from last year, born in around February. I haven't seen the one for a long time, but that doesn't mean that it's not alive. It could well just have moved out of the area, particularly if it's a male. We always suspected it was, but that was the case. nibble around the branches and I've said that the cubs doing the, or the clan is doing well in this drought because of the access to food and Michael Fleetwood you were wondering if access to food or having more food will determine the cubs survival and that you thought rather it was the case that the bigger stronger cubs killed off weaker ones food definitely plays an enormous role so essentially, if, food sh if there's a food shortage in the area, good morning, are you going to come and investigate us? Are you going to ignore us completely? Interesting, watching it, watching this cub track around, sniff all of the areas where the hyena that came in earlier anal pasted. Now that whooping call, sorry, Michael, I won't get back to your point, but that whooping call that that individual gave was essentially a clan identifier. So it was saying, I'm part of your clan and I'm coming up to say hello. Please don't attack me before, you know, by surprising them. So it's essentially knocking on the door. You can think of it that way, of the clan den site. But Michael, yes, if food is short, then the high ranking females are the ones that have access to it first and foremost and they will dominate a carcass and it will take the submissive hyenas or the lower ranking hyenas a much longer to have access to it and they may even not get to feed at all during times of or harsh times what that means is that the matriarch's cubs have a higher chance of survival because here we go you're going to nibble a branch. But yes, because their mothers are well fed and therefore lactating, the cubs have a better chance of surviving. And generally the matriarchs or the, the cubs of the higher ranking females have a better chance anyway, but that's particularly pronounced during times or during harsh times or difficult times for the hyenas. In terms of stronger cubs killing weaker cubs or the civil side that's quite often spoken about with the hyena clans. I don't think it's as common as previously thought. I read an article about it that was saying essentially it's quite unusual. But if two females are born to the same litter, that is because generally the hyena cubs inherit the status of their mother, so it's established at birth. But with two females, they then have to get to the point where they battle it out. Two males less so. And with males and females, the female automatically assumes the dominant role. But if they come from the same litter and it's two girls, they do occasionally fight it out. And if there are recorded cases of them killing each other, actually what's more common is the is other females as part of the clan. Hello, you're back again. Killing the cubs of others. It's got fresh bite wounds around its neck as well. It's hard for you guys to see and hard for you to get a uh, view of it. But you can see that injury on the back end. It's actually quite, that's come from a skirmish similar to the one that we witnessed a couple of weeks ago. These are fresh injuries. This is probably something that happened either last night or the day before. And judging by the submissive behavior of this hyena, I would say it was probably, those wounds were probably caused by the more dominant members of this clan, which would also explain the whooping call that it gave as it entered the den to try and placate 
the matriarch and pretty, who's also fairly high ranking in my opinion. And Michael, just to finish off my answer to your question about the access to food, as I was saying, siblicide is less common than originally thought, although it does occur. But what is more common than we realized is aunts or unrelated members of the hyena clan with cubs of their own killing other cubs. And it will happen when the mothers of those cubs are not present. And it happens generally, I imagine, it's more common that it occurs during times of less access to food. Make sure keeping a close eye on whoever this hyena is. Peering over the top of the den where it disappeared. I can only give you my guess as to what's been happening at this den. A lot of it is a supposition. November has returned to mom for a thorough cleaning. Now that all of the excitement's over. Wow. We saw that individual wander through with those injuries, but Christopher, who's watching in Arizona, you are obviously aware of some of the fights that have happened within this clan over the last few weeks, and you were wondering if anyone has seen the injured hyena. I haven't, personally, and not none of the other presenters have, as far as I know. Unless the individual that wandered through now was one of the ones, maybe the one that James saw. I'm, not, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that. I can't confirm it at all. But as always, I encourage the screenshots. Yes, girl. Come on, call your babies out for us. It's been interesting to watch this hyena as well with her new set of cubs. We don't, we haven't really got to see them all that often. But she so often stands up and just sticks her head down into the den, almost like she wants to reassure herself that they are safe. A lot of the time she doesn't even call. Just checking up. It looks like Bella behind her, the, the hyena that's just entered the entrance to the den is her previous cub. It's also been interesting to watch how that bond between the two of them has lasted even now that there's a new set of cubs coming through. Oh, did you see? What happened there? Did you just decide that you were going to lie down there? And they've all settled down once again. So let's go and get an update from Scott and his progress. Well, welcome back everyone. And we've got some exciting news. Cedric and his tracker have found some leopard tracks and called us into the area. And you can see they're busy off the vehicle. Morning, Ced, how are you doing? Good, man, good. So as you can see, they are trying to work out where this leopard has gone. It's not an easy business once they leave the road. So we're probably just going to continue driving here and let them focus on being on foot. And it's so lucky that we do have the guys with their trackers because the trackers are often far better at finding these animals than we are. So. We have, are going to leave Cedric and his tracker to do the, the hard work and call us once they've got lucky, hopefully. <laughs> and I've checked, through, I've checked that road very carefully, said no sign of it coming up, but I'll do another loop around. Okay, cool. Where do you, where do you want me to go? Back around again? Okay, sounds good. Morning, everyone. So, we've just done a loop around the area, and again, I can maybe pull out my map and show you exactly where we are. 
Cedric came into this area because not only did they, have they found the tracks now, but initially they actually heard some impala alarm calling. So that's what brought them into this area. And let me show you exactly where we are and where we've already checked. Okay, so we're in the southwestern corner of Arethusa at the moment. So that's the southwestern corner there. And we are the blue dots. Oh. And Cedric came along from here to where we are now. He suggested we, we had driven the southern boundary and then up here and then we took track south all the way up and then back down to this position. So we've completely encircled this block, which we think the leopard is in, and that's where Sid was walking, just in that kind of a direction. So we're gonna do another loop around, and like Cedric said, it wasn't long ago that these Impala were alarm calling, so the leopard could still be nearby. Oh, have you ever found a woodpecker? Oh, I wonder what type it is. I can't see it too clearly now. There's actually two jumping around in this tree. And these are bearded woodpeckers. I'm just going to creep forward a little bit here, and the other one's in a better spot. You see it on the overhang, underhang there. There we go. Awesome, look at that. I mean, the fact that it can just hang on upside down and hop around so easily is a small miracle in my mind. And I guess what aids in their ability is that they have got a special foot structure with two foot toes facing forward and two toes facing back. This is the male with the red head. And you can see he's using his beak to dislodge little pieces of marula bark and hopefully find some small insect larvae underneath. They are specialists in feeding on larvae of insects and pupae that are busy growing up under the protection of the bark. I think this is the female now. She's got an entirely black head. And the birds are certainly alive this morning. Woodlands kingfisher calling nearby. Chick -brrr. Good. Well, we're going to continue now. Good view of the woodpeckers, but I want to keep moving and see if we can't try and track down this leopard. I'm guessing that it's shadow from the area that we're in, the same leopard whose tracks we saw quite earlier, a long distance from here. <clears throat> well, Monkey Man would love us to find the Anderson male leopard, as would we. Um, he could pop up. We have checked the likely areas that he usually does move through. Um, and no, no tracks of a monkey man, so at this stage, not looking usually promising, but he could surprise us at any moment. Um, but the leopard we are looking for now is a female, according to the tracks that Cedric had a look at back there. Good, well, we're going to send you back to Jamie for one last peek at the hyenas before she moves off, and hopefully we'll have some good news by the time you get back. As you can see, all is peaceful and quiet at the hyena den. Madam got up and moved to the other entrance and went and said hello to November and Pretty. And settled down for a good breakfast. And a nap at the same time.
Uh, the injured individual has wandered off somewhere around the back of the den, on the eastern side of the den. And Roy Phelps, you're wondering whether hyenas are prone to any kind of infection when they get an injury like that. And actually, this is quite a nice example. Oh, sorry, Andrew, can you go back in one moment? I was just going to talk about the notch on her ear. So hyenas are incredibly tough animals. Not being cooperative, but she does have a bit of a nick on her right ear. Hyenas are unbelievably resilient. Their immune system, and actually that applies to all of the animals, they can suffer injuries that would absolutely be mortal wounds for a human being and are able to heal. I've seen hyenas with three legs. I've seen hyenas with no tails, no ears. They are incredibly or have incredibly powerful immune systems, partly born of the fact that they spend a lot of their time eating rotten carcasses. They're not terribly fussy about what they eat. But also just in general, as with all animals, any kind of open wounds or cuts are heal up very, very quickly. And a nick like the one that I was chatting about earlier, that can be caused by just a little nip and maybe a bit of infection around the edge that heals up within a couple of days. Having a good sniff. Enjoying the morning air. Look at that face. Madam's up now. I wonder if she's going to call her cubs out of that entrance. I don't think so. They generally don't come out of that particular entrance to the burrow, but they should be getting big enough now to move between the two. Come on, girl. Bring your babies out. I'm not sure if you can hear that low growling contact call she's making. Oh. <laughs> whining squeals. There's a tantrum happening there. Mom got up to sniff the air and November is now having a thorough tantrum and screaming about it. Begging for Mom to lie back down. for a moment so you can hear the cacophony of sounds that are happening in that direction. begging paid off. Now, Melissa, you've asked an interesting question. So we, I expressed surprise at the fact that the matriarch already had cubs so soon after the birth of Bella. You were saying that you've read a paper that said that the lower ranking females will lactate for longer and feed their cubs for longer because since the cubs inherit their mother's status, they have less access to food. And it just goes to show that even within research there is a disagreement. Move forward fractionally so you can have a nice view. They always keep us busy at this den. So yes, Melissa, it just goes to show how research and bear in mind of course that different hyena clans in different areas of Africa will have evolved different tactics because I've read a paper that says exactly the opposite and that the matriarchs feed for longer or the higher ranking females lactate for longer and feed their cubs for longer. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Resting her paw on her cub. 
I, I would suggest that your version is probably correct in this area because we've seen it. We've seen it happen with the matriarch coming through. And then again, also, there are no general, well, there's no rules out here. So there might be completely different approaches depending on the time of year or whether or not it's a drought versus whether it's a season of, or a wet season, which makes life a little bit harder for the hyenas. I think I saw a small... Did you see a small cub? Yeah. Come on, little cub. November is so cross. That squealing sound. Still hungry. Here we go. It's better. That's why I'm always very careful about making any definite statements about the way that hyenas behave. People have been studying them for years and years and have not yet to come to any definite conclusions. There might be certain correlations, but then again, not everything has to be or has one cause or one effect necessarily. The circumstances can all play different roles. So as I said, time of year, size of the clan, the status of the female, they can all play a factor in how long a female lactates and feeds her cub for. Whether it's a single cub or two cubs, we probably... Ah, there we go. Hello. Our oh, patience paid off. Welcome, little one. You can come out. Stump is in exactly the wrong place. <laughs> A brief, brief glimpse of the new cubs. Absolutely. Wing nut, I agree with you. I love sitting with the hyenas. They're always up to something interesting, and you're guaranteed, no matter what kind of day, even if they are sleeping when you first arrive, you are always guaranteed that something interesting might happen, or is going to happen. You were saying we need a 24-hour camera up at these den sites. I completely agree. Imagine if we could watch them all the time, and the amount of stuff that we would see going on in the middle of the night. Hello. Once this little cub disappears, then I am going to leave, even though I wish we could sit here 24 hours a day. But we do have other things to go and explore and other things to go and see. But I'm very glad that we had that brief opportunity to see this little cub. Come on. Bath time. Oh, number two has arrived. and vanished again. Oh. This is when hyenas are at their most appealing. Hello, number two. You get to watch how gentle their fierce warrior mothers can actually be with them. No. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Curiosity starting to play a role. Aren't we lucky that we get to witness this? Some of their first excursions out into the world. <clears throat> the one, there you go. You can even see how its little teeth are, have come are, are already out. As I said, they're born with them sharp little weapons and that scar that we can see on the one's back not this individual but the other little cub is probably from the sibling 
just to carry on that conversation about what he was saying about the fight for dominance. If the matriarch in particular has given birth to two females, we might be in for some very interesting cub interaction. Hello, girl. Yes, your babies are beautiful. Well done. Well done. Clever girl. Pretty stretched out with a very contented little cub as well. Looking very at peace with the world. Awesome. So glad we got to see them eventually. Persistence and patience paid off. And hopefully they're going to start making an appearance more frequently. Hello. That's not mom. That's not mom. <laughs> oh, a sudden realization. That's definitely interesting, hey? Look at those scars on that hyena cub's back. I wonder if they are... I wonder if they are scars or if maybe it's some kind of skin infection. It does happen. Less, you don't often see it, but you, you could get a hyena with mange. Might be that that little cub is predisposed to it. Hard to tell. I don't think we'll be able to tell until we see that cub more clearly. Now, when mothers move them from different den sites, they do so incredibly gently. So it's unlikely to have been from her jaws could be from one of the other cubs. Uh, the maternal bond within the animal kingdom is one of the strongest, or d probably the strongest bond between any of the animals out here. And Anna Marie, you were wondering if the matriarch would fight to the death if another predator were to threaten her babies. She would definitely make a lot of noise. It depends on the predator, if I'm completely honest. As much as she would love to be able to protect her cubs, and she probably would try, she would still be very, very cautious of actually physically tangling with something like a lion, for example. A leopard, there's a much better chance. She would be incredibly defensive, and she'd probably win in that case to try and protect her cubs just because of that extra aggression that would come out in defense of her babies. Wild dogs, again, depends on numbers, but wild dogs, as we saw when they came through at this den site a couple of days ago, they're less likely to actually hassle the hyenas at dens. And quite often with wild dogs, we've spoken about the interaction, and of course everybody thinks about Scott sighting with the wild dogs attacking that hyena, but generally it's a very, very intense rush of growling and maybe the odd nip, and then the wild dogs let the hyenas go. So it is really unusual for them to hassle a hyena to the point that she'd have to defend her cubs. But lions, if lions were to surprise or ambush this hyena den, the matriarch would try to defend them, but I think that with very little success. Well, they did pay us a brief visit. It's wonderful to see them out and about. But I think it's time for us to leave them to go about their... Oh, maybe not. Sorry. I was going to say we're going to leave, but we've got the first good view that we've had all morning. Investigating the world outside. Look at those patches, it's so interesting. I don't know, I don't think that's scarring. Looks like a, some kind of skin disease. I'll have a look into it. So cute. Little bundles of trouble. Oh, getting so brave. Matriarch's calling him back for bath time. And as we've spoken about, that bath is actually quite important for those cubs. They will be defecating and urinating within the den, so obviously building up parasites on their coat 
that the mother then helps to clean off and keep clean. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. That's pretty making a noise. It's so interesting. We'll never know the true dynamic between the matriarch and pretty. Suspect they're related, the degrees of tolerance they have for each other's cubs. I wonder what they're saying to each other. They're saying something. for you. <laughs> Look how nervous she is of them. She knows the matriarch is watching. <laughs> still wobbly. Joints are still a bit weak. The coordination's not quite there. into the den. <laughs> mm. Gilly, he's watching in Wisconsin. A couple of weeks ago we witnessed just after we discovered the new cubs, or well, I think it was actually just before the new cubs made their first appearance. Gilly, you were wondering whether, uh, and you, as you say, it is complete speculation, but you were wondering whether the injuries on that cub's back might have been caused by the aunt or cousin or whichever individual that was that was attacked, and then that hyena was then soundly punished for it. Um, Gilly, I don't know. We'll never know. As you said, we'll never know exactly what that was all about. My suggestion would be that it would be unlikely that a low-ranking female would attack the cubs of a matriarch, but again, pure speculation. Your guess is really as good as mine. We know that the hyena that we saw that was attacked is the mother of the twins from February last year. But we'll never really know what it was that she did to deserve that treatment. Whether it was connected to the cubs, I, s I don't know. I thought it looked like she'd been pregnant, or that she was lactating, but it was impossible to really tell. Whether or not she had cubs of her own, I'm not sure. Maybe she was trying to defend her own cubs. We'll never know. We will never know the answer to that question. That's what makes hyenas so incredibly fascinating to watch. For me, it is the fact that we may not have all the answers and we may never have all of the answers. We can only watch and observe and allow them to fascinate and entertain us. Now, Jem, you were wondering where the other young cubs are, the other twins, D1 and D2, so born in December, or probably actually born in November, but first seen in December. You were wondering where they are. They're still in the den. I did see them this morning. <laughs> Look at this. Isn't this amazing? We've got the best view we've had of these cubs ever to see them out like this. But yes, I did see D1 and D2 when we first arrived. They've then gone into the den because Corky's wandered off and I think they'll probably be having a nap. Oh, that might be one of them now. Who's that November? 
<laughs> November's one and all. There we go, there's November. So there we go. We have an answer. Either D1 or D2 has come to investigate the new cubs. we watch these or has as we've been watching these cubs suckle you are asking a little bit more for a bit more detail about the hyena's milk so i've mentioned before many times but for new viewers essentially hyenas have some of the most protein rich milk out of any of these mammal species out here sorry it's getting very warm it's going to quickly take my jacket off and marianne you're wondering if maybe it's because they eat so much in the way of bone which then benefits them nutritionally. And obviously with the additional calcium, which we know that milk is rich in, that's a very good point, Marianne. I hadn't actually thought of it that way, but there's no reason why it shouldn't be the case. There's a lot of theories, of course, that Marianne and many of our regular viewers will be familiar with because we've talked about them before, but that the fact that that nutritious milk that they produce, and it is exceptionally nutritious, is maybe one of the reasons that the females have evolved to be a complete exception to most mammal rules and to be bigger and stronger than the males. Hello. Hello, gorgeous. What's that? Give it a good chew. Give it a good chew. Thoroughly, thoroughly investigated. Hello. <laughs> and when they look at you like that, you can see what Pam Shirley means when she says that they look like little bear cubs. Welcome to the world. So much to explore and to learn about. Starting with that stump. Oh, thorough investigation time. Mm, not so brave. <laughs> Come on. Breakfast. Breakfast time. There we go. Enjoying some of that nutrient-rich milk that we were chatting about. Here's a question I don't know the answer to. As far as I know, in kittens, kittens, and I'm not sure if it applies to the big cats as well, but I know in domestic cats, kittens have set nipples that they feed off from their mothers. So essentially each kitten has their place that they adopt in feeding time. In dogs, it works completely differently. Dogs, it's a free-for-all, and whichever puppy manages to make it to the nipple and latch on first, that's where they go. I wonder whether hyena cubs and twins have set nipples that they suckle from. I doubt it. I imagine it's probably a free-for-all. Never thought about that before, and whether or not it applies to the wild animals as well. Yes, you munch that stump. Build up those powerful jaw muscles. You're a fierce predator, aren't you? Very scary. Get chewing. <laughs> you get that coordination down. Oh no, breakfast is more distracting. Prospect of breakfast. Make room, budge up. I'm watching the cubs of this matriarch, and Linda, you're wondering whether or not it's possible to have more than one dominant female in a hyena clan. And to the best of my knowledge, no, although it can be very difficult to initially determine which is the most dominant female particularly if she doesn't have cubs at the time that you're watching the clan or observing the clan. 
and there will be high-ranking sisters all related to her that could easily give the appearance of being the matriarch. So as far as I know, no, there's only one, but there is a close, con oh, it, there's a very sort of narrow margin between the different rankings at a high level. And then also there's always the possibility of a coup, which I've spoken about before. So essentially where some of the hyenas of a subordinate rank in a different matrial linear line, so unrelated to the matriarch, if they start to outnumber her, they could quite possibly overthrow her and establish one of their own as the new matriarch. Well, this has been a wonderful moment, a wonderful morning spent with these cubs. I've been trying to leave for the last hour and they keep doing something new and fascinating to rivet us here. Hello. Well, I think we've enjoyed the best moments that this hyena den has to offer us this morning. And thank you to Kevin Catfish who sent through that update about the huge breeding herd that's heading towards the Juma Dam camera. I think we should go there now, go and investigate. As we know, the lions have been following behind the breeding herd. There's brand new calves wandering about. I think enough, although I'd hate to say it, enough hyenas for the morning. Let's go find some other things to look at. Bye-bye, hyenas. Well done. Thank you for a nice morning. Thank you for bringing out the little cubs. Natasha, it's an absolute pleasure. I didn't want to leave until we'd seen the cubs and I was starting to give up on them coming out, but I'm really glad that we stayed. It was totally worth it just to have that opportunity to see them and to probably have the best view that we've had of them so far since we first realized they were there. I can't wait for James to get back so he can see them as well. James is the one who discovered this den and spent a considerable period of time waiting for the new cubs to show themselves, only to go on leave, and then they popped out a couple of days later. And for those of you wondering about James, I know lots of you have been asking as to when he's back. <laughs> you know, Brent and I spoke to him on the phone last night, and he's back on the... 31st. He will be back on the 31st. I had a moment, I couldn't remember if it was the 30th or the 31st. So he is coming back. And we'll get to see him very, very shortly. I think it's about a week's time now. Uh, while we've been with the brand new Cubs, Scott's been out on foot tracking things. He's made his way back to the vehicle. So let's find out how his tracking went. So, I've just got back onto the vehicle and we've managed to piece together the puzzle of what has been happening with these leopard tracks. So, I'm going to pull out the map again and I'm going to zoom into this little junction where we are here. Now, the leopard tracks were coming along in an easterly direction along this road where I'm following the little stick here. And then it got to this junction and it took a left and then this is where Cedric and his tracker were looking for the tracks and that's the direction her tracks were heading in but this is obviously where the Impala spotted her and from here she, I found her tracks going in the completely opposite direction down here so she's veered off here and then done a loop as soon as the Impala saw her and run away and got lucky to find those tracks going in the opposite direction to where she was originally moving. So at least we now know what's going on. Cedric had to race off, so it's just us now following up on these tracks, but I'm gonna get on the radio quickly and just update the guys. In case anyone comes into this area later, 
The station tracks with this Mufazi Ingwe head south towards the cut line from Central East West Junction. And still good prospects. We're still in the area of a leopard. And it could be sleeping now. It could be relaxing in the shade. Or it could still be on the move. But we are in the general area of where it's been moving. So things are looking good. And even though I can't follow her footprints now, otherwise you wouldn't be able to come along, we can do another big loop around the block. And who knows, maybe we'll hear some monkeys alarm calling or some more impala. Get some useful clues from Mother Nature as to where this leopard could be. She could well also veer back onto this road after her initial game plan of trying to evade further alarm calls from the Impala that detected her. And that's actually what led me to search in the opposite direction to where her tracks were heading initially, because it's quite often, or quite common rather, that leopards will obviously not want everyone to know their whereabouts, and as soon as they are detected, they will do their best to get away as quickly as possible. So she may have just set it south temporarily and then she could veer back east and back north onto this road. Um, another thing, especially now that it's so dry, is water will play a big part in a lot of animals' plans. So the Arethusa waterhole is off to our left, and I'm hoping that may lure her back towards this road and eventually to the waterhole, which is further to the left, north of us. Well, it sounds like you guys ended up having a wonderful sighting at the hyena den with those little cubs continuing to poke their head out just as you're about to leave. So, glad that they kept entertaining you guys. And happy to hear that there's also a very large herd of buffalo wandering around Juma that Jamie is busy trying to track down. So, good prospects all around. We're on the trail of a leopard. Jamie's on her way to a large herd of buffalo. Who knows, maybe some lion uh, also on the trail of that herd of buffalo that Jamie's looking for. That would be wonderful. And that was the case just a couple of days ago. Lions managed to bring down a young calf from the herd of buffalo that was on Juma. Uh, just turn this radio off so we don't have to deal with all the cackles. Just seen some tracks on the road here. No, the hyena tracks heading in that direction. Not what I was hoping for. Southern Grey Hornbill calling very loudly behind us. sure if this is good news or bad news <laughs> but Terry's just updated us that there are currently three cheetah at Incora waterhole and I didn't know that so thank you for the updates sadly it has little or no impact on our lives because we cannot go there so if anything it's just torture knowing that nearby not too far away are three cheetah that is the reality of any wilderness destination you go to. You can't be everywhere. And quite often you hear wonderful sightings being had around you while you scratching your heads trying to busy fi try to find something for yourself to look at. But thank you for that. And 
it just shows that there is hope that we may be able to show you cheetah at some stage. They do occasionally pass through Juma and Arathusa, so you get lucky, but it's very, very intermittent, the viewings of cheetah that we get, sadly. I've never actually worked in an area with incredible cheetah viewing or for a long period of time, so it's one animal that I really would like to spend more time with in the future in a different wilderness destination. But the Sabi Sands is renowned for the leopard, not the cheetah. And that is why we do get so, so spoiled on numerous occasions with great leopard sightings. Michael Fleetwood, and he's interested to know about the aging Karula and whether or not she will still be fertile, or whether leopards as they become older become less fertile, and yes, I think just like humans and most animals, and leopards will become less fertile as they become older, but she's not quite there yet, Mike. 12 years is old, but not ancient, and she could very well give birth for another four years, possibly even five. And some leopard have been documented living into their 20s in the Sabi Sands. Now, I don't know exactly how old they were when they had their last litter, but I don't think Karula is too old. And if anything, I think the reason why we're assuming this is because I think that she would almost 99% of the, uh, well, there's a 99% likelihood that she would have given birth to cubs in the last year, over 20, in 2015. Once, definitely, but possibly even twice. And both sets of those cubs could have been killed before we had any idea that she had even had them. Oh, well then, VM. VM spotted two African hawk eagles. There's one in the lower branch and then one just above it there. And some of you who were, were on the Sunset Safari yesterday may remember a sighting of the same bird. And off they go. They are renowned for hunting in pairs like that and are extremely good at hunting wildfowl like guinea fowl and Franklin. So, Mike, I feel quite strongly that it's not Karula's infertility or Tingana or Vula's infertility that is causing the lack of cubs. I think that she has given birth and simply lost her cubs. And a lot of people will be quick to congratulate or quick to judge leopards who lose their cubs or don't lose their cubs and for me it's a, a lottery you know Karula has had an incredibly good track record up till now for raising cubs but that's not necessarily all due to skill a lot of it would have just been mere luck and I feel like she may have been unlucky well she certainly was with the litter that was or the, the final cub of the litter that was killed in early 2015 by a hyena but it's fairly common for leopard to lose their cubs, not only to hyena, but to other male leopard that didn't father them, lions, pythons. So that's what I think's happened. I think she was just unlucky, lost her cubs once or possibly twice last year with no one even seeing them. Well, I'm hoping that's the case. Because having an infertile female leopard occupying your core territory is far from an ideal situation to have because it means we're never going to see cubs. But I don't think that is the case. So, let me just give you an idea of where we are in relation to where I had the last tracks. Just to keep everyone in the loop. Uh, 
And I'm told that June is busy asking where exactly we are. So I'm going to zoom out completely. And where you see white, that is where we can go. On the right of the stick is Juma. On the left is Arethusa. And we are this tiny little blob, blob on the southern boundary of Arethusa. And I'm zooming in. So there we are, southern boundary. And the last tracks we had were heading south and east over this junction. So I'm hoping somewhere along this road we are going to find a leopard. Good. Sorry, because we are so far on our southern boundary, very far away from the final control, I'm battling to hear Kirsty's updates coming through. But Karen, uh, great to have you with us. And very big thanks to Nicole, who introduced you to Safari Live. So thanks, Nicole. And Karen, we've been trying to tell all of our viewers to spread the word, because the more people that join us, the more places we'll be able to take you to. Now, Karen's interested to know which is my favorite animal and which is the most friendly animal that we see out here. Well, my favorite animal is probably the leopard. It changes from time to time, but I really do love leopards out of the big cats. And not only do I love them to look at and because of their incredible beauty, but I love them because of the challenge that they give us when trying to track them, like right now. So tracking down leopard is one of my favorite activities. I thought I just heard an alarm call there, that's why I switched off. Very difficult to be certain with the vehicle running. But good just to sometimes stop and listen and make sure, especially when you know you are in the area of where a predator is moving. So Karen, yes, the leopard would probably be my favorite, or at least high up on the list of favorites. And the friendliest animal. Hmm. That's a tricky one. Um, let me think about that for a while. I mean, we have, so, we have so very little interactions with the animals. We merely view them and spectate them. And very often, the animals don't even give us the time of day and act as if we are not even there. But one of the friendliest animals. Hmm. Which animal makes me feel welcome? friendly. There we go. And Viem just took the word out of my mouth. Possibly the hornbills. And maybe that's because of their cartoon-like appearance that makes them appear friendly or their wonderful call. Um, so maybe the hornbills or the birds are, are, are more friendly. Their cheerful choruses in the morning are also very welcoming. So yes, I guess the hornbills will be will win the vote for the friendliest of the animals out here that I can think of for now. But like I said, usually they don't treat us like that. We are their friends, sadly, and just treat us like we don't even exist. Really, they sometimes just look at us quite strangely. Um, Another good point just come through from Kirsty in the final control, saying that the younger animals are often more friendly or possibly inquisitive, and it's maybe that inquisitive nature that leads us to feel that they're more friendly, but they just wanted to kind of work out what we are, I guess. Karen, it's great to have you with us, and a very big thank you to Nicole for letting you know about Safari Live. Your job now, Karen, is to let one of your friends know. And if that continues, the ripple effect will cause us to be able to take you on, who knows, maybe safaris to the outer space. 
That would require a lot more people joining us though, but it's possible, anything's possible. There's no animals in space, so which is a good point that VM has just brought up. <laughs> but that's as far as we know, VM, so that could change. And who knows, maybe if we do some more space safaris, we'll be able to track down some rare Martians. What would be nice, though, is just feeling that sense of zero gravity, I guess. That alone without any animals would be quite fun. <laughs> well, James Richards just commented that pushback can occasionally be quite friendly. One quite recently I found in my outdoor shower, and that's why James has made this comment. James, I, I hear you, but that pushback as well as this human both got equally massive frights, I believe, when we bumped into one another. Uh, thankfully, it didn't decide that charging me was going to be its best option of escaping because the little horns would have made short work of me. It would have been an embarrassing way to go. I mean, with all the dangerous animals that occur out here, to be impaled and killed by a bushbuck would not be ideal. I'd rather be squashed by an elephant if I can choose. Better way to go. Anyway. So now we've kind of passed the point of where I think that leopard would have popped out. We are too far west. And because the leopard was originally heading east until it got that I'm not a fright, but it had reason to change direction after heard of Impala detected it. Um, we're going to have to do another loop back into the area. So, some of your thoughts on what the most friendly animals can be. Our chair Sherry had a wonderful, wonderful few sightings actually with a small nocturnal animal called a genet. And Sherry said when she was up in Kenya, she even arrived back to her room one night and there was a genet sitting on her bed. And yes, genets can be uh, quite habituated in and around camps so that's often the best place to see them is in camps usually the clever genet that have worked out that they can get easy meals they batter their eyelids at the lodge staff and at the guests obviously that behavior is frowned upon but it is a reality as to why certain animals do become very habituated in their own camps Best to try and avoid getting into those situations though. And even a small animal like a gen, it can become a pest in time. It knows it can get food from us. other things if there are any sausage tree fruits or sausage trees in this part of South Africa and yes there certainly are Ken 
Um, not that many though, there's <clears throat> one on Juma, um, and I don't think it has too many fruits this summer season. Must have a couple at least though, but in other areas of the Sawi Sands you do get a few more of them. And I'm very happy to hear that you are enjoying these live safaris. Having been in South Africa quite recently on a safari, this is a great way to keep you in touch with the bush until your next safari. direction that we're heading in. I can't see any of the tracks just yet, but Cedric did drive down this road, so there's a chance that he would have already squished those tracks. It'll be interesting to see where she comes onto this road. It's useful often to know where leopards have come from in order to try and forecast where they're going to get to. It's a lot of guesswork, but like I said, very useful to just understand a little bit more about where they've come from as opposed to exactly where they're going. Now I can hear that noise squeaking and I don't know what's causing it. Ah, I found it. It's the windscreen wipers that I turned on by mistake. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsty. I was beginning to ask myself what it was. onto this road fairly soon though. Hello to Chris in Arizona and you'd like to know what happens when an animal like a leopard dies out here. Will it be buried? Will it be removed? Will it simply be left there? And it'll usually be left um, in the bush, as with most animals. And we need to get you across to Jamie quickly. Guys, look at this. We, we're just holding off. I've been trying to follow up on them. Yours called us in. He found them for us. So we owe him a big thank you. Guys, it's the Nkahumas. And they've been yeah, following this buffalo road. Awesome stuff. They're looking hungry. One, two, three, four, five. All five females from the Nkahuma pride. Awesome. That's how that old now looking much bigger. So the herd of buffalo down at the dam, I can still see them. Keep your eyes on the Juma Dam camera itself as well. I don't think the buffalo have seen them yet. They're not aware of them. The lions know the buffalo are here. They've probably been following them all night. eyes in the back of my head. They're definitely all in stalk mode. And females are moving up using the wattles as cover. You can see everything in their body language is pure concentration. And now this becomes a game of patience. And I think it's a very good idea 
for Scott to come through if he can stand by with the buffalo. There's also elephant herds as well. I'm going to take this opportunity to reposition while I can. Obviously, once the action happens, we will not be able to change once they start to stalk. Hello, ladies. Thank you for showing up again. And I think Scott must come quickly. That's a message deliberately to FC to come and stand by at the other side of the dam. Oh, I've just come and stopped at an open patch. There's a lion stalking just ahead of me in the bushes. Awesome to watch that body language in action. Lying down in the shade, she's going to assess the situation. Safari, you want to know whether we're about to see a kill? And I would say almost definitely. Andrew's giving us an awesome perspective on the scene that's about to unfold. Buffalo, elephants, lions stalking and lying in the shade. And it's all a question of patience for them. They are looking so hungry. But they want to make sure that they don't waste any extra energy in a failed attempt. So they're going to start this whole process. Now, it's a huge open area between them and the buffalo. They can't afford to be seen by either the elephants or the buffalo. And they're going to have to figure out a way. And there's always the possibility that the buffalo will actually come towards us. And some of the buffalo moved along the drainage line while we were waiting for the lions to come out. So there's more than possible that some of the buffalo will start walking towards us. If they do, it will be the perfect opportunity for these lions. And Manti girl, welcome to our sunrise safari. Apparently, this is your first sighting of lions. I'm so glad that we could bring you these views. I'm actually now that they've settled down. I'm just going to move forward a little bit so we can get you a nicer view. I also want to be able to assess the body language of the buffalo. So, Manti girl, these five lions, these five lionesses, are part of a pride known as the Inkahuma pride. And they are fierce and practiced buffalo hunters. time I've seen all five of them together in a very, very long time. I'm stopping here just so that I can assess the situation. And I just want to check with yours that I'm not blocking his view. Yours for Jamie. We could go just a little bit down there. Yeah, we that's a good point. Let's go forward a little bit. I think we have a grip here. They are directly in their view. This is so exciting. As I said, the first time I've seen all five lionesses together once again. And actually, this gives us a good opportunity to have a look at the way that the buffalo are positioned. All crowded around. are doing is thoroughly assessing the situation. I just wanted to get you this view, but I don't want to sit here for too long because I'm blocking their view now of what's going to happen. 
And I don't want to force them to have to expose themselves. But they're looking across. And Safari, Dean, you were saying you love how each individual has a role in the hunt. And what's amazing about it is the way that they communicate that. It's this wordless cooperation. And a lot of studies are being done into the role that those ears play in coordinating a hunt like this. So the back of the ears are dark in color. That means that the lions, those parts of the lions, those crucial parts of their body language are highlighted and emphasized. And scientists are, and behavioral scientists are starting to do a lot of research into the way that it plays a role in a cooperative hunt. You can see in their body language, relaxed but expectant. Jamie, come in, Jamie. You're standing by? Did you see that small elephant on the other side? The buffalo. <laughs> okay, copy. No, I didn't see him. <laughs> he was just telling me about this little elephant male, little elephant bull that's chasing buffalo on the other side. <laughs> You're up to mischief, little one. What an incredible scene. I don't know where to look. Now it seems as though my game drive communications are playing a little bit of or having a little bit of interference on our signal. Unfortunately, I'm going to need them to be able to coordinate with yours, who's also standing by to let him know if anything changes. So just so you know, if I do speak on the game drive channel, it might give a bit of a shiver but it won't disrupt anything in any major way. Buffalo is still completely unaware Jamie, for Scott. that they are being watched. Scott, go ahead. Jamie, I'm just coming up to them on get away uh, this head. Yeah, Scott, if you can make your way down to the pan itself, um, there's Nyari and Ndlov there. Um, we're on the northern side with these in Gala. Hi, okay, can't be very good. Thank you. Tense and expectant. They have to choose the right moment to strike. as long as they remain in unseen. They will have a perfect opportunity to hunt. They've approached from upwind, so their scent won't be blown across to the buffalo and the elephant. So as, lo as long as they're careful, they will be absolutely fine. And Brazos, you were wondering whether or not the elephants might chase them away. And I think we'll be fine in this case. The elephants haven't noticed them. The elephants seem to be distracted by the pan. Look at them, look how alert they are, trying to have a look, pick an opportunity, and decide which way these buffaloes are going to go. Now, they would have been following them all night to try and see. She got her. That amber eyes that we're looking at. One of the lionesses has just got up to move. I don't know what she's seen. The others don't seem to be alert to it. Oh, I think she's going to move back to the rest of the pride. That head rub greeting. So nice to see the Nkumas. Oh, Scott has arrived, so let's have a look at how the scene is going to play out from his perspective. Well, isn't this exciting stuff? And you can see Jamie and the lioness 
and also the elephant and some buffalo. So we are on the other side of where we're supposed to be and I can see smoke coming out of this car. So that is a big problem, VM. Can you see that smoke coming out? We're gonna have to maybe actually reverse out of this side. So can you see the smoke coming out of the engine here? So this is not what we wanna see. Um, but obviously I don't wanna get caught here with these buffalo. So we might wanna send you back onto Jamie's vehicle while we deal with whatever's going on here. Lions, elephants, buffalo, Scott's vehicle, smoking. I'm sure everything's going to be okay, but he does definitely need to double check that, especially with all of the equipment that's on the back. I think Scotty might be out of commission for now. I've repositioned so that we've got a better view of the lions and that they've got a better view of the waterhole and what's happening there. fairly certain this is Amber Eyes, so she's one of the lead females of this pride, or one of the older females of this pride. Then there's another one, probably her sister or a cousin of a very similar age. Then there's two young females, and then there's one sub-adult female. I think that's the sub-adult. I mean, she's got so big now since I last saw her. The one surviving sub-adult after the attack by the Birmingham boys. So to see them together as a pride is such a pleasure. And isn't just this the most incredible African scene? And for those of you who are watching, I would suggest you keep tabs open with both our feed and the Juma Dam camera so that you can keep an eye on both because this morning could turn out to be very very exciting and we just do not know when they will decide that the time is right to strike <laughs> and a uh, <laughs> comment from Nikki's uncle, Nikki's uncle, Philip Austin, <laughs> who said that the sighting is so exciting that Scott's vehicle caught fire. Hopefully he's okay. I can see him still. Um, both he and Vim are off the car, busy double checking what's happening there. So fingers crossed they're all okay so that we can have two cameras on the back of the vehicle, or two cameras watching the sighting. The intensity of those lions' faces, all that concentration. They've been following probably all night. Yours has told me they were around Bifelsukaya Munzi Dam last night. So they've been moving all, the, all through the night, trying to keep up with this herd of buffalo and just anticipating and waiting for their best opportunity. Now, last night would have been difficult for them because it's full moon, which means that they've lost their main advantage, which is their incredible night vision. <laughs> Peekaboo. Looking for breakfast through the branches. Ears up and eyes focused. Luckily for these powerful hunters, they know the value of patience and concentration. Led by the two older females, who know exactly what they're doing. I wish I could tell them as well that there was some buffalo that moved into the drainage line, because what they really need now is either for the buffalo to start moving towards us or to move into an area where there's some thick vegetation to provide extra cover for them. Because the, there's a huge space, a huge open space where the Vuyatela Dam used to be before it dried up. 
that they would have to try and get around without being seen. So they've got two options. Either they wait for the buffalo to move into thicker vegetation, or they creep through the drainage line on the other side of the dam. And I wonder what they're going to decide to do. And it's also, as Brazor says, although the elephants haven't spotted them now, if they were to reveal themselves, and if they were to come up closer, <laughs> oh, little one, you're still chasing buffalo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As the buffalo move across, <laughs> chased by the elephants, let's pop over to Scott. So, apologies for that mild panic that I got in earlier. I thought the jigger was about to go up in flames, which thankfully it didn't. Um, I'm guessing what it was, because we drove here in such a hurry, the car started getting very hot, and you'll probably find there was just some grass uh, or, or little leaves stuck under the car, some of that were getting smoldering or smoldering due to the heat of the engine. But the smoke has stopped and there is now no more risk of us exploding. So we can show you where the buffalo are in relation to where Jamie is. Some of the herd is to the right of our vehicle, but then another portion is to the left. That's what you can see now. And Jamie's just beyond them. And I'm trying to work out where exactly the line are. There's Andrew looking back at us. And they are apparently in the middle of the screen in the shade. And a little bit high up in the top of the frame there. So under the shade of a little guari tree there. And I wonder what the line are going to do now. If they're going to wait for the buffalo to move off or... You'll probably find that the lion may have already attempted to try and catch these buffalo once or twice already during the course of the evening. So I think that's why the buffalo are a little bit on edge. to hear that Phil Austin is joining us on the live safari. Morning, Phil, and you're right. The intensity of the sighting is so much so that the car almost combusted. So hot stuff here, and great to know that you've tuned in for this action. I hope that these lions get their act together and start pursuing these buffalo a little bit more readily. Because for now, it looks like we may be at a bit of a stalemate. And because it's heating up, I'm losing faith in these lions actually doing anything this morning. But good prospects for this afternoon. And maybe w w while these buffalo start moving on, maybe that's what the lions have been waiting for. And I'm almost certain that these buffalo have had a very rough night being chased by the lion. And because the lion know that the do you better or far better off chasing a herd of buffalo that are worked up moving through thick bushes opposed to being out in this open clearing here. So maybe that's what the lions have been waiting for. You get a good idea of just how dry it is as the buffalo's hooves kick up dust as they move. And this is quite a small herd with regards to breeding herds of buffalo. There's probably only about maybe 50 or 60 individuals. And that is quite good for the lion because it means that there's a, a smaller chance of a herd regrouping and chasing the lions off any victims that they may have caught. And that's what buffalo will often do. They'll get a fright as any animal would when lions pop out. And if one of their herd members does get pulled down, they will often regroup, come in and chase them away. But because this is quite a small herd, the lions stand a better chance of actually being able to stand their ground and ward off the buffalo that are returning to try and win back their herd member. Now, I was hoping that the buffalo running was going to incite a little bit of action from the lion, but had that have happened, I'm sure you would have be, been raced across to Jamie's vehicle. And... 
They are looking in this direction, I'm told the lions, but <clears throat> not interested in moving just yet. So I want to just creep forward a little bit more and see. Uh, I think we can get a view of them from here. This is a bit better. We won't be able to see Jamie and Andrew, but I think I can see the silhouettes and heads of the lioness. Yeah, we can just make them up. So they do have their heads up there, just in that shady patch in the top left of your screen. You can see the outline of a lioness's head and ears. And Jamie's car just hidden by some bushes there. The old Juma Dam cam is in the foreground in the Tamboiti tree. That's the little white thing you can see sticking in the tree. So that's where the Juma cam used to be and where it will probably be returned to. I think that's just the old one that's still up there. We've got a new one up now with better images than that old one gave out. But when we do finally get some rain and the official Juma Dam does fill up with water, that's where it'll be in that Timboti tree, I'm guessing. So, Buffalo, how many times did the lion try and jump on your back last night? You look a little bit frazzled after a tough night out. Diana's just asked a good question, and where are the male lions when you need them? A couple of males to bolster these lionesses' artillery would certainly help the matter. And it's not the case that the lioness will always lead the hunt, Diana. It's kind of a bit of a misconception, and male lions are often alone, and therefore they will often lead their very own hunts, and they can be incredibly successful hunters, especially with bigger prey like these buffalo. And you may find that if the males were hungry, they could be the ones actually leading. But I guess you're right to a degree. The, the lioness are usually the ones there making more of an effort, but it's not always the case. And a few males would definitely help our cause with seeing some lion buffalo action. But sadly, none are around. And I think it's just the three lioness. So not easy for the three ladies to bring down a buffalo and then keep the rest of the herd at bay. Anyway, we're going to send you over to Jamie so you can take a closer look at exactly what these lines are up to. These lions still intently watching the goings on at the dam. They were watching as the buffalo stampeded away from the elephants. And now it becomes time for them to make a decision. It's starting to get hot and their opportunities are dwindling. They're going to have to decide if they're going to follow on. They will definitely follow behind this buffalo herd. They will track patiently, wait for an opportunity to catch a straggler. But as I said, they don't want to waste any kind of energy in making an attempt that might fail. But they're going to pick their moment perfectly. The one thing about lions is that they are ambush predators. Although they're cooperative hunting, means that they've got a bit more leeway than something like a leopard. So whilst one lioness will lead the attack, the others will flank the animals so that if they change direction, there's a lioness waiting on either side, with a couple of them racing behind to help bring down the animal if they do manage to catch it. And Maggie, absolutely. Maggie M, who's watching in Australia, she said that this laser-like focus and attention that these lions are showing is incredible. And this is important. This is a matter of life and death. They've got to make decisions. The females have got to decide and keep the rest of the pride alive in the actions that they take over the next few hours. A hunt is a dangerous thing for a lion, especially a buffalo hunt. They never know when the tables might turn. Buffalo are big animals. The Kahuma Pride, as we said, have had plenty of practice. And Brent and Andrew, who's you, Andrew? Hey, yeah. Andrew was filming the kill that they managed to catch on camera, where they brought down a buffalo bull. 
Well, they don't have a male with them this time. They don't have Junior with them. The male's always a, a helpful ally in that respect. Sitting surrounded by the bones of a previous kill that I think was actually theirs as well. And wildebeest in this case, many months ago. <laughs> I think she's got something in her paw. Now the flies are bugging her. Mercedes, you want to know a little bit about the background to these wonderful lionesses. So, to the best of my knowledge, the Nkuhuma Pride were originally from the Kruger area, and they moved in, and they called the Nkuhumas because they were found under a brown ivory tree. And Nkuhuma is the local name, the Shangar name for brown ivory. Now, when I first started working here, I was told the story of how there were nine members of the Pride originally. So it was six adult females, two sub-adult females, just, a, just coming out of the cub age and up to sub-adult age, and one young male, one sub-adult male. In February of last year, apparently one of the lionesses was killed by the Birmingham boys. I'm not sure where that happened, um, and it was the sort of the first burgeoning signs of the takeover that was going to start to come under play, or come into play rather. So originally the Nkuhuma Pride were controlled by or generally moving in the territory of the two big Matimba males. Then in July, the Birmingham boys made their first real play for power and the Matimba males fled. They realized that they had to pick their battles and they didn't even try and Oh wow, that is an awesome, fierce teeth of the predators. Yes, the Birmingham boys came in, they chased the Matimbas away, and the biggest problem with that then was the youth of the Birmingham boys actually translated into terror for the lionesses of the Nkuhuma pride. So they responded with aggression, their testosterone levels were flying high, and they killed one of the Nkuhuma lionesses, we think, although we'll never know the truth behind it, we think in defense of the sub-adult females and junior, probably the sub-adult females. The Birmingham boys then got hold of one of the sub-adult females and killed her as well. They were just at the wrong age, just at the cusp where the Birmingham boys might have decided to leave them alone. So generally when a pride takeover happens, the new males kill the cubs of the females to bring them back into estrus and to provide them with mating opportunities and the chance to pass on their own genetics. And the sub-adult females were just, just that little bit too young. So the Nkuhumas fled in terror. And for a long time, they were very scattered, very fractured. And eventually it was a, one of the young females that we first saw finally making a ploy for peace and mating with the Birmingham boys. And Mercedes, you were also wondering whether it was possible these lionesses could be pregnant with the Birmingham boys' cubs, or indeed any other male, because quite often there's a level of playing the field in lionesses, good way of ensuring that, or increasing the chance of their cub survival. Generally what happens during the pride takeover is that first estrus cycle that the females go into is a false estrus. First of all, to placate the males, but also then to make sure that they don't waste any energy in terms of raising cubs, only to find that actually the new males have been displaced again, because there's always a period of transition and confusion within a takeover. And quite often what will happen is one coalition will go in, take over, and then get booted out by another one. So they don't want to waste their energy producing a litter of cubs that may inevitably be killed by a new set of males. So that first estrus, <laughs> elephant snorting. That first estrus is a false estrus. Now the Birmingham boy takeover and the first mating, when did that first mating happen? I think it was around September. I could stand corrected. My sense of time and perception tends to go out a little bit. So the first, you're looking at about the first three to six months of a new pride male takeover that the females will be in false estrus. But at this point, now almost six months down the line or seven months down the line, there is a chance that one or more of these females is pregnant. 
They have been seen mating with the Birmingham boys since that takeover, but it will be a time before we start to see cubs. I believe that there's a good chance that there is a sticks cub on the way. Hello, beautiful starling. Look at the way that it's shimmering in the light. Completely ignored by the lioness. So that bird is completely black in color. And that or that glimmer and the sheen that its feathers take on actually comes from the way that the keratin of the feathers is laid across the melanin pigment, so across the dark pigment. And it creates a reflection of the green and the blue that we see here. So all it's doing is absorbing light and reflecting back the iridescent colors. Fierce focus. And Kat, who's watching in tempo, you were just commenting how you can see the differences in the individual lionesses' faces. And you can, but you can also, what I like about it as well is the similarities. You can see how they're all related to each other. But each one has a unique, it's like a family. It is a family, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. It's not like a family, it is a family. So brothers and sisters, that all look similar but different. The lionesses are the same. And we call amber eyes amber eyes because she's got those incredibly orange eyes. Not all that unusual in lionesses, but you do get some of them that definitely show up with a more orange eye. Now the standoff begins and patience has to begin to show. Let's go over to Scott's side and see what's happening over there. I think it might be worth coming to us now. They're coughing. Uh, They're coming. Right. Okay, so we couldn't resist but make sure that we got you into the area for this young elephant's display that it's about to put on. Now it's come out and here it goes in search of trouble with these buffalo. And I'm actually surprised how far it's distanced itself from the rest of the herd, which are behind us at the water hole still drinking and isn't this awesome and the fact that it's looking quite clumsy with that half wet face half white face or dry face rather and as this young Ellie toys with the buffalo Nancy would like to know if we think these buffalo are waiting for the elephant to leave the waterhole. And yes, that certainly could be the case, especially if the buffalo haven't had a drink yet. Now, I obviously don't know that, but I assume that is the case. And not too sure also how close they were to the water's edge earlier, but that certainly is a good theory, Nancy. And there's not much water around, so these buffalo will be more than happy to wait their turn but they're going to have to get past this very intimidating young elephant before they can think about that. It's not unlikely that this elephant gives us a little charge as well while it's on its rampage. And while things are at a bit of a stalemate, we can show you a bit of a... No, no, it's not at a stalemate just yet. Here it comes. Is it your turn to pick on us now? Unsure of yourself, young man. <laughs> Let's see if it can't pluck up the courage to get this little portion of the herd that's lying down up and on their feet. Also on the topic of animals waiting for a drink, Kyle is interested to know if the lions may also be waiting for the elephants to finish off their drink. And certainly, Kyle, good observation. And the lions know that it would be silly to go up and try and get to the water now because the elephants will make sure to chase them away. Oops, the 
this young Ellie doing? I think she's just standing in the shade of these bushes. But let's give you a kind of 180 degree view of everything that's going on around us. Just so you've got an idea of where these buffalo are in relation to the line and the rest of the herd of elephants. So the dam wall's right in front of us over there, and then the lion are just through this next little gap over here, sleeping in the shade still. There we go. There's Jamie's car, you got a glimpse of, and the lioness. Haven't moved a muscle, and then further to the left is the rest of the herd of elephants who are really enjoying taking their time at the waterhole. Good. So, what I'm thinking of now doing is, oh, here, we need to get you across to the alley quickly. And he just started trundling towards the buffalo there. Here he goes again. Look at him holding his head up high, trying to make himself look as big and mean as possible. spots in case he does decide to jump them again. <laughs> I don't know if the elephant got a bigger front or the buffalo. <laughs> uh, it's awesome. Absolutely wonderful. Interestingly, actually a portion of the herd of elephants did already move across in that direction. So maybe this youngster is trying to catch up with those ellies that have already moved off. Not to be certain, but it wasn't that wonderful to see the young boy getting a little bit ahead of himself. Whew, well it is really heating up now and I fear that we may have to wait until this evening for these lions to get their act together. Although, you guys may still be in luck a little bit later on. I think once these elephants do move off, there's a strong chance that these lion may come for a drink at the water. So whoever the zoomy is, good prospects for you. But for those of you who are wanting to see a lion's hunting buffalo, one of the most epic of showdowns to see in Africa, we are going to have to wait until this evening, I think, for that to happen. There's two birds of prey soaring up on the hot air thermals to our south. They could be African hawk eagles, the same kind of birds we saw earlier across on Arethusa. Hard to tell from here. But this is going to be wonderful watching how quickly they manage to rise up. And it further emphasizes how hot it's getting now. And at this time of the day, all of the birds of prey are going to be making the most of riding these hot air thermals high into the sky without having to flap their wings even once. Well, it looks like we're going to have the rest of this herd of elephant passing by us. I'm just going to roll forward to get into a good spot for that. getting this VR remotes up and running as the elephants come past us. So that's the beeping you can hear, that's the VR camera, films 360 degrees. And I just needed to let off a little clap there just to activate it and let's see what happens as these Ellie's stream past us. Now, just like earlier, the young bulls may be the ones that show us a little a bit of attitude, just like those young bull, or the young bull earlier, chasing those buffalo. This looks to be two young bulls making their way past us now. What are they going to do? Hey, boys. Interested in showing us how big and strong you are? No? 
Okay. Well, your cousin over there has just been chasing the buffalo. We won't mind if you do the same thing for us. But they all seem very relaxed, and there's just one bull now that's left behind, still drinking at the water's edge, so there's still prospects for one other Ellie to come streaming past us and show us what it's made of, as the young bulls so often do. Kevin Catfish, you would like to know my thoughts on what would have happened had the elephants not have been here. Um, well, because I wasn't here initially, it's hard for me to say, but I'm guessing the buffalo would have drank, and the lions may have tried to, to make an attack on the buffalo, but it's, it's, it's so difficult to, to hypothesize what may happen, Kevin. Um, there's only one way of finding out, and that's just to be there as the event unfolds. The chance of the lions taking down these buffalo, though, or even attempting to stalk them in this open area would have been very slim. I think, even if the buffaloes were drinking and no elephants were here, there's not much cover for the elephants to sneak up on them, and therefore I don't presume anything different would have really actually happened. Okay, Kevin, well, we're going to send you back onto Jamie's vehicles to see exactly what these sleepy lioness are up to. And apart from the odd movement to dislodge any flies that might be bothering her, the lions don't seem to be showing any signs of moving. The temperatures have skyrocketed from the moment we saw them until now. It's probably, the temperature's probably gone up at least 10 degrees centigrade. It's now sitting over 30 in my estimation. So already a boiling hot morning before eight o'clock. And I think for now, the opportunities are done, and it's time to rest up, preserve as much energy as possible for the explosive hunt that is going to happen, or hunting attempt that is going to happen, either later this afternoon or sometime into the evening. At least we know we've got an incredibly exciting day planned. Now keep your eyes peeled on the Juma Dam camera in between the drives. Let us know if you see them moving. I know I don't have to ask. Our regular viewers do it all the time and update us as to which way the animals have gone. If they do move, I suspect it will be to keep track of the buffalo herd. They might follow behind it. And so where they go this afternoon will be determined by where those buffalo decide to move to. I think at the moment they've decided it's not worth the risk of overheating. It's just too hot. These huge animals produce so much heat in those bursts of energy that they put into, into their hunts. <laughs> Both Shannon and Majikle, you were saying it would have been thoroughly more convenient if the elephants decided to chase the buffalo in towards the lions. And just as an interesting aside, we get asked fairly regularly how often lions have to eat. Remember two days ago, we were sitting with three of the lionesses with very round bellies. And right on cue, they are hungry again. So now you get to see it actually play out in practice. For those of you new viewers who are wanting to learn a bit more about lions, heads up again, I think in response to a little bit of noise from the lodge. Now looking across to see what's happening with their buffalo, with their breakfast possibilities. I think, ladies, your breakfast buffet is on the move. But for them, a bit hot and time to hide in the shade. And Pam, Pam surely wants to know how tall these lionesses are, and it's so difficult to get a perspective when they're on camera. 
and probably at shoulder height, Pam. I'm about 5'7". They would come up to at shoulder height, close to my hips, at head height, close to my chest. But what I do have for you, which I just have to find, if you give me one moment, is a picture of the comparison in terms of, or a, a scale picture to give you a rough idea. So there we go. For Pam Shirley, oh my word, that's bright. The <laughs> sun is so bright now. The lionesses are slightly shorter than the male lion that they've pictured here. But there you can see in comparison to a grown man, roughly how tall, the female's back would probably come up to about here. So slightly shorter. We're talking over a meter in terms of height, so over three feet. I just want to have a look quickly and see if I can figure out while we look at these lionesses what the tallest recorded lion is. So generally females average about ooh, about a meter, yeah. That is about right. A meter, so three feet in height. I'm trying to see what the if it, if this book has the largest height. I can tell you that the heaviest female, just an interesting aside, was 175 kilograms, which is absolutely enormous. That is, 175 kilograms is close to 350 pounds. So that is huge for a female. The heaviest male, the biggest male ever recorded, was about 260 kilograms. So close to 500 pounds. These are big animals and they're powerful. But what that does mean is that they have to preserve their energy very carefully. Oh, as we approach the end of the sunrise safari, let's go back across to Scott very briefly and then we'll spend our last few moments with these females. So it looks like this herd of buffalo are temporarily in luck and I don't think I'm going to have any further attacks from the Inkahuma lioness. If anything, it's the elephant they need to watch out for and hopefully that young bull doesn't terrorize them too much through the course of the day. It'll be interesting to see whether these buffalo move and how far during the course of the day because it is very warm. So that bodes well for the lion. Hopefully the buffalo won't be too far from them this evening. And it also bodes well for all of us then because the sunset safari will be incredible if we see a showdown between those lioness and these buffalo. Even if the buffalo disappear though, there's bound to be some other potential prey coming to the water hole. So they are very much in a good spot for an ambush, possibly during the course of the day and even more likely later on. And Aaron, it is interesting stuff and quite surprising that buffalo do fight back and will often actually injure lion quite critically. And it is wonderful to know that some of the prey species can actually stand up for themselves when under attack from the predators. And interestingly enough, more often than not, Aaron, when viewing this very same pride, the Inkawuma pride, often actually hunting in this very same area, we've seen them being shown up and made to look like uh, they don't know what they're doing by the buffalo. The lion come charging out, hoping to turn the buffalo and get them running, and the buffalo just look at them and, if anything, start chasing the lion away. So it can be quite humorous and be prepared to lose a lot of respect for lions because buffalo will often show them up. Guys, it's been a wonderful morning. Thank you so much for all of your contributions, questions, and comments. Well done to VM on camera and to Nikki and Kirsty in the final control room. We're going to send you back to Jamie and the Lions for the last few minutes. And we started this sunrise safari by saying that we have no idea what to expect. Since we come to you live and the animals create the stories themselves, we just have to go along with it. And what an epic morning they have provided us with. Surrounded by the previous remains of an old kill, the Nkuhuma Pride patiently waits for an opportunity to take down a buffalo. 
We will catch up with you on the Sunset Safari. A big thank you to Andrew for all of his wonderful camera work, the lovely ladies Kirsty and Nikki and FC, as well as to you, Eugene. And thank you so much to all of you for your questions and your comments and all of the wonderful things you have to offer. Join us this afternoon. It's going to be epically exciting. Cheers, guys. We'll finish off with the last view of these lions.